thanks so much. Did, um, did you ever wake up one day, look around, and uh, you go through your routine in the morning, and you look up, and you find yourself, in, and you're in the office, and you ask yourself, how did I get here? You just don't remember what the process that you went through to get there. If, you, if, you, if that's ever happened to you, and I trust it has, you probably know a little bit about how I feel standing up here today talking about developing biopharmaceuticals. If you listen to um, Christian's uh, introduction, you know that I'm, a, I'm an old economic development guy uh, and really don't know that much about or never thought I knew that much about uh, technology, about pharmaceutical development. And, uh, you know, I look over there and I see my, see my friend Dave Atkinson, and I see the look on his face, and he thinks I'm psychic because that's exactly what he's thinking, is that, uh, so, but nevertheless, uh, circumstances, circumstances have brought me here, and uh, it's my pleasure to talk to you today. I'm here really to try to tell you a story. It's a story about vision, it's a story about innovation. Uh, I'm afraid that I'm going to have to use some slides, and... Um, I'm going to have to use a little biology. Uh, I won't use a lot of biology. I can't tell the story without it, but a little biology is really all I can use. But, and I promise me I'll, I'll keep that to a minimum. Um, I'm also fully aware that um, I'm the only thing standing between you and the bar. So we'll, we'll, we'll progress with this uh, as, as well as we can. Um, so um, a little bit about KBP, uh, based in Owensboro. You're looking at an aerial shot of our, of our facilities and campus, and I won't elaborate on it very much, but the, the big building, uh, rectangular building, I, I do want to point out, because you're going to hear later on about how we use tobacco, and uh, I'll pause here and see if I can spit this out, but that big building is a fully automated, indoor, environmentally controlled plant growth facility. In other words, we grow our plants indoors. Uh, they get no artificial outside light. And you're looking at, what you're looking at is by far the biggest facility of its kind in the world. We're proud to have that in Owensboro and in Kentucky. So what's the history of KBP and why is there a KBP? So let, let me take you back to around 2005 and the Owensboro Davis County community and indeed parts of that region were in the process of actively reconsidering their economic development strategy. Uh, like a lot of rural communities in Kentucky and across the South, most of their economic development strategy had been built around attracting industry. It's, good, it's a good worthwhile pursuit. Uh, communities need to do that, but uh, they also felt like that they were missing out on uh, what some people would call the new economy and not taking advantage of the ability to leverage people, leverage innovation and, and bring that to the community. So um, a few people uh, developed a strategy to go about doing that, leveraging some existing local assets, uh, went out and built a partnership with the University of Louisville uh, that I'll talk about a little bit in a moment. Uh, built a partnership with Owensboro Health at that time and still is the biggest employer in that region, created the Owensboro Cancer Research Program and participated in the creation of Kentucky Bioprocessing with the goals focused on certainly economic development of the community. That's what prompted the idea was to drive economic development in the community in the region. Uh, but also because of the missions of the university and the missions of Owensboro Health, wanted to be able to participate in things that would contribute to the overall mission of those, of those institutions. And then finally, uh, like good capitalists everywhere, wanted to make some money in the process of doing it. So um, KBP was born. Uh, and I would say to you that intentionally and on purpose, uh, it's a little bit of an unusual enterprise. We're a for-profit company, and I've used this slide, uh, very much a platypus. Uh, we're, we have a, a, a very different business model, uh, have had a very different business model than you would have seen in uh, typical biotechnology companies and pharmaceutical development companies across the state and certainly across the country. Um, a little bit, little bit of this, a little bit of that, a little bit of everything, very opportunistic model. 
and I can vouch for you by telling you that there's a lot of people who can tell you that that last sentence is true. The males at KBP are venomous. So uh, we were, as I said, we were founded, uh, started operations in April of 2006. Uh, in 2007, uh, we acquired some additional technology that helped us to grow. Uh, in May of 2007, we initiated a collaboration with a small company in San Diego, Math Biopharmaceutical. That'll come back in a minute, and I'll explain to you the significance of that. Uh, in uh, 2008, we entered into a development agreement with Bayer and their subsidiary, Bayer, the big conglomerate German pharmaceutical company, and, and their subsidiary, Icon Genetics, uh, pursuant to which we end licensed some technology that uh, uh, Bayer had developed, and uh, in turn, uh, Bayer contracted with us to develop products for them. Very significant deal for us because it gave us credibility in the marketplace, and we went from being a a small company in the middle of nowhere to having a collaboration that we could we could really build on. In April of 2010, we entered into an agreement with the U.S. Department of Defense. This flowed out of the 2009 uh, swine flu H1N1 pandemic where there was a great concern about the lack of ability to rapidly produce vaccine in this country. And we had been bragging about how quickly we could produce vaccine and they showed up with a big contract and said, prove it. Uh, that resulted in March of 2011. Um, uh, you probably can't see the slide, but we produced uh, 500 grams, that's a half a kilo of protein in a 30-day period. That's roughly equivalent to about 10 million doses of a flu vaccine. Uh, and to this day, that is the largest plant-based manufacturing campaign that has ever occurred on the planet. And then uh, in January of 2014, we had grown to the point where uh, we were seeking additional investment. We needed to grow further, and we were acquired by Reynolds American. That is, uh, some people might know that company better as R.J. Reynolds Tobacco Company. And uh, I think their, their interest in uh, acquiring KBP would be evident and as I go through more of the presentation. And then uh, the subject of today's, uh, uh, I think, topic and the reason that uh, there was interest in having me here in August of 2014, the uh, Ebola pandemic in West Africa became global news and we were thrust right in the middle of that, uh, of that unfortunate episode. So I mentioned earlier, we're different. Uh, the biggest, I think the biggest area where we're different and the biggest thing that we knew going into the creation of our company is that there were certain elements of the development process, of the drug development process, that we knew that we did really, really well, that, that we had um, a, a area of expertise. But we also knew that there were elements of that process that were very expensive, they were risk-filled, we did not have the internal expertise to do those things, and so we had the choice of going out and hiring people and growing up and building overhead to be able to do those things, or we could collaborate with others who already knew how to do those things. So good example here, and this will flow into the, to, into the ZMAP uh, exercise. You have KBP, uh, who does the product development, We'll start down here maybe with MAP as, as the better example. It's a gr small group, as I mentioned, in San Diego who figures out that um, uh, some particular combination of a recombinant protein may have a particular therapeutic or treatment effect. Into that steps KBP with our ability to take their concept and turn it into reality, to make something that is in someone's imagination to take that and make it real, something you can touch, use, and test. And then uh, our other collaborator is Icon Genetics, that's the company associated with Bayer, whose technology we use to help us do those things. Um, so together we bring a, a much more integrated pharmaceutical development company while each of us are able to focus on the things that we do well and not have to be distracted with the, uh, the, the other elements of the process and also very significantly don't have to bear the risk associated and the cost associated with trying to do those things. 
So uh, a little bit more about MAP, I won't belabor this, but small company like ours founded in 2003 with a focus on uh, uh, prevention and um, treatment of infectious disease. Uh, small, actually a smaller company than we are, but make uh, an excellent collaborator for us. So uh, here's where I get into a little bit of the biology, and I'll, I'll do this quickly because I don't want to get over my head. But um, talk about biopharmaceuticals as opposed to pharmaceuticals. Um, a typical pharmaceutical, uh, pharmaceuticals that were on the market uh, exclusively maybe 25 or 30 years ago would be considered small molecules. Uh, those products are typically made through some chemical synthesis process. In other words, you take the same chemicals, you put them together the same way every time, and you get the exact same result. It's a relatively simple manufacturing process. The representation in the small box at the top of the screen represents the molecular structure of an aspirin. An aspirin is a, an example of a small molecule pharmaceutical. The molecular structure at the bottom of the screen is a, is a representation of a protein that's a, or a biopharmaceutical. As you can see, that it is a much, much more complex thing. Um, they are biopharmaceuticals, are proteins, large molecules, and they are much more difficult to make. And the way that science makes those is harnessing the power of biology. You're using some biological substrate, some biological mechanism to actually produce that product. Um, a lot of products on the market today using biopharmaceuticals, billions and billions of dollars out there. Uh, the, the, many of the products that you see advertised on television are biopharmaceuticals. Many of those are actually monoclonal antibodies. I'll talk about those in a moment. Uh, but the standard systems out there that where well, these products have been made for years and years and years, uh, there are products made in genetically modified horses, genetically modified sheep, uh, in yeast. There are products that many of you or people you know have used that are made in E. coli bacteria. The most common system is uh, big stainless steel bioreactors filled with hamster ovaries. And those, those hamster ovaries are genetically modified to produce a product. We're simply using a tobacco plant. It's a biological uh, organism, and we simply use the tobacco plant to do that. And I would say to you and ask you the question, would you rather put something in your mouth that came out of a plant or something that came out of a hamster ovary? And <laughs> now, now we've, got, we've, got a little bit better, we've got a little bit better value proposition than that, but it's pretty simple to get that message across to people. So um, we're out there working with our system to, to develop that, to convince people that it's worth using, and, and to put products into that system that we, can, that we can take and commercialize. Strengths of our system, this goes back to my argument with the Department of Defense, uh, the biggest strength that we have, much, much faster than any other system. And that goes not because we're faster, it goes to the nature of the biology. Um, the uh, typically... And, I, and you'll see an illustration in a minute about, about how we develop the ZMAP, but uh, in, a, in, a, in a CHO system or a Chinese hamster ovary system, uh, two and a half to three years to get product that you can even test. We can do it in 45 days. That speed is, is an enormous advantage in, in some applications. Uh, speed means uh, typically lower cost. We do it, if we do it quicker, it typically is less expensive. Um, and plant systems uh, bring uh, better safety profile than CHO systems. Um, the biggest weakness of our system is that we don't yet have a product that has been all the way through the regulatory path. So in, until the regulators have fully blessed the system, there will always be the question, is there something about the system that they may, that they may rebel against? But we continue to develop products and get further and further along that path and more and more comfort that uh, that is a problem that will take care of itself. So a question that I often get asked is why tobacco? And um, I brought a specimen that I'll show you. You can look at that later on. Um, this is what the plant looks like for us. The biggest advantage that we have is that uh, tobacco grows rapidly so we go from seed 
to about this tall in about uh, 24 days. And at, at this height, we then transform the plant. Uh, so th the speed of the system or the speed of the plant is a, is a huge advantage. Uh, the fact that the protein that we want to produce produces in the leaf, not in the stem. You can see that the plant is almost all leaf, so, so much more efficiency there. Um, the uh, leaves are very large. It's not a food crop. Those of you, you know, you pay attention a few years ago, there was a, uh, where ethanol was growing and you saw the disruption in the corn supply and what that meant at the grocery store. So we don't have any issues with, uh, with that. Um, the plant is extremely well known, well researched, so you know, you know much about the mechanism of it. And then, uh, very importantly for us, there's a great deal of local expertise about how you grow this stuff. Uh, and so we're able, we're able to take advantage of it. And then the final reason is that uh, as part of our manufacturing process, we're going to make this plant very, very sick. We're intentionally going to make it sick. This variety that we use in the Cociana benthamiana is native to Australia. Uh, it's set on an island for eons and never developed any natural disease resistance. So when we make it sick, it gets sick fast. Uh, when it gets sick, it starts to manufacture our protein for us. So our manufacturing process, um, we figure out what product we want to make. We figure out what gene or what group of genes are associated with that particular protein. Those, those genes are then cloned into a bacteria, an agrobacteria. We grow up a lot of that agrobacteria. Um, we put that agrobacteria in a chamber, uh, a vacuum chamber. We have robots that will take this group of plants into the chamber. The plant is turned upside down uh, or, or inverted if you want to be scientific, but I say it's turned upside down. Uh, it, it dips down into the liquid. The doors on the chamber are pulled when the, or are shut. When the doors are shut, a vacuum is pulled. When the vacuum is released, that agrobacteria and those foreign genes have now been sucked into the plant. The plant comes back out. It goes back into the growth room. It now has a foreign gene in it that, it's, that it recognizes, and it starts to manufacture the, our product for us. So the way I've tried to describe it, imagine this plant is a little bitty factory. Imagine you have a little over 3 million of these plants in your facility, which is what, which is what we can handle. Um, and inside that little bitty factory is all the equipment, all the machinery, all the power, all the manpower that is necessary to make a product. All we're doing is sticking the blueprint into the plant so now the plant knows what, it, what we want it to make. It goes to work making uh, after it sets in the growth room about seven days after it has been transformed. We bring it out, we turn it upside down again, and we have a hedge trimmer. We, quite literally, we have a hedge trimmer. And we lop off the, the, the leaf material, we capture that, and it goes through a purification process. Here I'll take you through uh, our facility very, very quickly. Uh, you see a, a little bit of the outside. The pink things there are the seeds. We produce those ourselves. Tobacco seeds are not pink, trust me. Um, we take those because they're so small, we coat those in a coating, sort of like an M&M. Uh, we do that because we want to make them bigger and we want to be able to see them. We want to be able to visually see that each tray has been properly seeded, know what it looks like. Um, you're looking down our rows of plants, uh, that row you saw, we have 14 of those rows uh, like that. This is plant is probably a week old. They've, they've just germinated, so they typically germinate between five and six days and pop up, and once they germinate, they grow very, very rapidly, remembering that we've put them at this point in the perfect environment. We have figured out what's the right temperature, how much airflow, how much fertilization, what's the humidity need to be, we control all that, and we get those plants to grow rapidly and look as uniform as they possibly can under this set of grow lights. Uh, our, our grow rows, as I said, we have 15 rows, one of which remains empty. They set five across, three high, and then on each end, there's an elevator, and that allows us to bring these tables up and down to where we can work the plant. Uh, these plants are coming down now headed over where they will be transformed. So the plants that you're looking at there are just regular old plants, nothing special about them. 
At this point, the plants have been transformed, and you can see they've been through that vacuum chamber, which they don't particularly care for. Uh, they've been, they, they've told me that. Uh, they've, been, they've been damaged. Uh, they're laid over. We've developed the growth parameters where there's enough stem where they can go back in, and the next day they'll stand themselves back up and start to look better again. Bridget here is taking these plants down to harvest, and you'll get a, a fairly good view of what the plants look like or facility looks like. Uh, a harvest, um, again, coming off the hedge trimmer into a, a lined tote where they then go into a conveyor system, taking them up where they'll be ground up. This is the, this is the grind and squeeze uh, portion of the process. So they're going to go up here. They drop down into this uh, vat. They're literally ground up. We're trying to rupture every cell to release the product that we made, the, the um, spun off, and then we create a great big vat of green juice. Um, and the green juice becomes the ultimate raw material of our product. At that point, we'll go through a filtration process. We take it into uh, uh, downstream process that is a very typical pharmaceutical production process. So once, in, in short, once we have the green juice, we're like every other pharmaceutical company. Everything before the green juice is unique, is unique to us. So Ebola, let's talk about that and bring that uh, unfortunate topic into the conversation. Um, a little bit about the disease. It's uh, something that, you know, last fall there was a, a great deal of, I'll, I'll, I won't call it hysteria, but it was hysteria in this country about this pandemic that was coming our way. But it's actually a disease very hard to catch. You have to really almost touch uh, a uh, bodily fluid that's carrying the virus. Um, in previous outbreaks, mortality rates were as high as 90%. Fortunately, uh, in, this, in this particular outbreak, the mortality rate's not quite that high, and I think a lot of that has to do with medical science learning more and more about how to treat it. It causes uh, hemorrhagic fever, which is something that you don't want. Uh, essentially, liquefy your organs, uh, and you'll ultimately bleed out through your eyes and ears and other parts of your body. Um, it was, uh, at one point, identified as a potential bioweapon. There is some indication that the former Soviet Union had, had weaponized it and therefore it became a, a important topic to, uh, to try and develop some treatment for. And as we stand here today, there are no licensed vaccines or treatments. Essentially, there's no treatment uh, or vaccine that any regulatory body in the world has approved as of today. Um, so ZMAP, um, I'll give you a quick timeline on that. Uh, prior to 2013, we had done some work and we had a program looking at developing a post-exposure treatment for Ebola. That's different from a vaccine. Our target was something to treat you after you were ill. And we had developed some degree of expertise in that regard. But um, nobody, including ourselves, had, had had any great success at that time. You come along with these, with these papers here, uh, all published in 2013, were three different groups had published some data that suggested uh, monoclonal antibodies might be an effective way to treat these products. One of those papers is actually ours. The, the one in the middle uh, is a paper that we had published for a product that we had produced. Uh, into that, uh, we all recognized that, again, I think one of the things that would be different about KBP, rather than pursuing these products independently, we got on the phone with the other two groups and we came together and we said, how can we, how can we come together to make a better product? From that flowed uh, ZMAP. Uh, what you're seeing here is a depiction of three different monoclonal antibodies. So we created a cocktail. Rather than us pursuing ours, a group in Canada pursuing, pursuing theirs, and a group in Europe pursuing theirs, we came together, created a cocktail of a, of a product. Uh, we made that at KBP for the very first time in January and February of 2014. It was the first time that that group of antibodies had been made together. Um, and then in June of 2014, we sent that material off to a lab in Canada to be tested. And here, here on the slide it calls it NHPs. What that, that's a code word for a bunch of monkeys uh, who 
who were going to be and were infected with Ebola. And we were going to test this product. We had no idea if this was going to work or not. Now keep in mind that at this point in time, the most success that anybody had ever had with treating Ebola was 66% survival rate with a treatment given 24 hours after exposure. So that's not very good when you consider that Ebola typically doesn't show symptoms for several days. So you, weren't, you wouldn't know that uh, someone needed to be treated or not. So we, we conducted this study, and I won't go through the, uh, the details of the slides you're looking at, but what it showed was that of the 18 monkeys that we treated, 100% of those survived up to seven days after exposure after symptoms were evident. Um, and so it was, it, we were optimistic going into this study, but we were all shocked that it did that well. Uh, and we knew at that point that we probably had a product that we were really going to have to accelerate. Keeping in mind that this is June of 2014 that, that we get this data. Um, while this is going on, you have an, an Ebola outbreak taking place in West Africa. It was and is the biggest, by far, Ebola outbreak in recorded history. Uh, th as of mid-July uh, this year, 27,000 cases, over 11,000 fatalities. Um, and if you think back to last year, much more news coverage in this country than, than you see about it now. Um, August of 2014, our product uh, is now public. Um, KBP is thrust into um, thrust into the, the limelight, a place that at that point we really did not want to be. Uh, we had our hands full trying to develop and, and produce as much of this product as we possibly could, essentially producing from a dead stop. Uh, no reason to think that we needed to produce more in June and July of, of 2014. So um, quite, a, quite a crazy time for us. The development path, if you look at this, um, we produce it, we, we get the monkey data in June. Uh, by August, uh, our product had been used in a human being, uh, showed efficacy in that human being, used in an emergency situation, um, and um, we began GMP production, meaning that we're now making the product in a way that it is intended to be used in a human. Uh, interestingly, the, the, the first patients who got it got the, sa the exact same material that was used in the monkeys because it was left over. Um, and uh, we, we ran out pretty quick, but we went back into production in August of 2014 so that by February of 2015, we're in a phase two clinical trial. Those of you who don't do drug development, you probably don't appreciate that. That's typically a five or six year process. Um, and it is, I, I would be fair to, Say it's unprecedented. Uh, unprecedented that the regulators, not only in uh, the United States, but in Europe, allowed use of a product in a human that had never even been tested for safety in a human. Unprecedented to go to a phase two study that quickly. That phase two study is ongoing as we speak, and we continue to, to treat patients in, in West Africa. Um, other products in the pipeline, and I'll show you this just again to illustrate, uh, we hope we're not a one-trick pony. Uh, we, um, again, one of the things that was different about us, going back to my earlier part of the presentation, we knew we had to be different. Um, a lot of small biotech companies have one or two products. They live or die on that, on, on that list of, of that, those products. If they don't succeed, the company doesn't succeed. We deliberately set out, because of our collaborative approach, to create a portfolio. We wanted, we wanted a small piece of a lot of products as opposed to a big chunk of, a, of one or two things. Uh, and so we've created a portfolio with a number of other products, if you look closely at that list, all in, in different stages of, of clinical development at this point. So to kind of bring it to a close, what does it mean? Uh, go back to what you know my goals, or what I said is our goals when we started. Uh, we're not quite 10 years in, um, a little, uh, about $150 million in direct economic impact in, in Kentucky and the Owensboro region. Uh, that's not 
based on any type of sophisticated economic model. That's just basic arithmetic. How much money did we take in? How much money did we spend in the region? Um, so whatever multiplier there is, you can add to that. Uh, employed between ourselves and uh, our colleagues at the Cancer Research Program at the University of Louisville in Owensboro. Um, uh, about 100 people, $7 million, uh, in excess of $7 million in annual payroll. Startup companies, uh, we've gained a lot of recognition for what we're doing there, not just at KBP, but also at the UofL program there. Um, uh, the UofL program there received a huge uh, NIH award, which is the biggest that the university has received, ba again, based in Owensboro. I see Dr. Box over here. We appreciate the collaborative program that Owensboro Community College has, has created around our technology and what we're trying to do. We've become a, a huge talent attractor for people from the region who have moved away and wanted to come home. We've got, um, and I, you know, I, I can talk to you about our lab manager, uh, left, was working at Wyeth in uh, Richmond, Virginia. Her husband is a physician. They came back to Owensboro because she wanted to work with us, and, and we've been very, very pleased with that. Uh, a lot of products headed to the clinic, and then, and then our IP and our patents. Um, so what does it mean for Kentucky? I, I think one of the things I'm particularly proud of is that it, it does show that innovation, uh, advanced development can occur in smaller communities. Um, that uh, we, we think of those things around major research universities in our large urban areas. It can occur in, small, in our smaller communities. It has to occur in our smaller communities if, if Kentucky's, gonna, Kentucky's gonna prosper. R take some vision, take some risk tolerance. Um, and you, you know, in, in our case, and I think this is true across other small communities, you have to do a pretty hard critical assessment about what your strengths are, what assets do you have, what things can you leverage uh, and, and, and put into play for yourself. Requires a lot of collaboration. Uh, you have to leave your ego at the door uh, and, and find a way to make success. And then ultimately, I'll tell you, uh, it's about people. Uh, and and I, I, I'll always conclude a presentation talking about the, the great staff that we have, most of whom are Kentuckians, uh, born and raised in this area. But uh, not only for KVP, I, you know, the theme of, I think, this meeting and in other meetings, it's, it's about people, whether you're talking about the success of our company or you're talking about the success of Kentucky or its communities. It's about how we identify, grow, develop, uh, and, and, and enable people to advance and contribute to, uh, contribute to our goals and mission. So uh, with that, um, I will uh, just you know, acknowledge uh, Owensboro Health, our collaborators. Uh, there's a lot of, lot of institutions that helped us there. I'll get down to the bottom and I have to give a nod to uh, uh, my friend Billy Joe Miles and, and Dr. Jeff Barber because uh, they're the ones who convinced me that an old economic development guy could come and do this. And um, I thought they were crazy. I still think they are. But um, nevertheless, I owe them a personal, a personal debt of gratitude. So that will conclude, Bill. If you uh, have questions or if I can uh, take anything, I'll be glad to try to do so. Well, interesting, um, the question that Dave asked was about the missionary visit. So the first, uh, the first uh, user of this product, if you will, first human user, was a missionary, was an American missionary, was, was working in Liberia, and through an incredible set of circumstances, and I, I mean, I don't have time to explain to you what that set of circumstances were, there happened to be uh, some leftover ZMAP from the monkey study uh, sitting nearby to his bedside in Liberia. And um, he, was, he was treated with the product and uh, subsequently recovered. And then uh, in November, he came by to KBP to visit. Now, it was, if, if, you know, anybody who has difficulty motivating your staff, that'll do it. Uh, <laughs> you know, he, he came in and he, and he told us, that actually the doctor who treated him came in and said that, that he was ready to pronounce him dead. And, uh, he was treated with this product, and within 30 to 45 minutes, he was up walking around using the bathroom. Uh, and uh, it, was, it was a very, very emotional uh, moment for our company and, and for all of our staff. Um, I would tell you that just today, uh, he's published a book, and I saw it today that it was actually published today. Uh, and we are mentioned in the book, and I'm, I'm, I'm proud that we are. Um, but 
I really don't have time to tell the full story, but it, it was truly a miraculous set of circumstances that this product was there at that time, and he was able to, to use it. And then that's, uh, you know, the, the, the personal side of that, Dave, is that I knew that at this point, this was a product, again, that I said had never even been tested for safety in a human. And I got word late on a Sunday night that they had used it for, for this missionary. And I knew that my Monday was going to be a very different day than I had planned it to be because CNN was reporting the story. And they were talking about the secret serum that this missionary had, had received. Now, the secret was available on our website and it had been up there for a while that we were working on this. But I knew that uh, the next day and the next few days were going to be very different than we had, we had expected them to be. But there was a whole series of adventures that, that had us getting material what we had left into the hands of the Liberian ambassador, and um, I can't do it. I can't do the story justice in uh, in the time I have. And, and I will leave. I will leave this plant here. It has not been transformed. It's safe to touch. Uh, I wouldn't. Uh, I, I would not recommend chewing it. However, that's a. Uh that, that's truly a fascinating story. Uh, it, it really is uh, quite a remarkable story. And I just have one, one question, and I think you, you touched on it, but for people who are here from all across um, the Commonwealth, there is then growth potential for small companies, uh, biopharmaceutical companies, to, to begin and, and produce in the state of Kentucky. Well, I, I, I would answer that yes, but I, I wouldn't limit that to biopharmaceutical companies. I, I would say that, uh, you know, depending on where you are, what small community you're in, you have different assets, you have different things that you can leverage. It's a matter of figuring those things out. In Owens Brell's case, this technology existed there. It existed in a company that went bankrupt, and they went bankrupt with a very, very different business model, with a more typical, traditional uh, biopharmaceutical business model that was focused on one or two products, they don't work, the company goes bust. Uh, so it, it's really a matter of finding what assets do you have, what tools do you have to leverage those assets, and then bringing together the parts and pieces that can make it all work. And in our case, we, you know, we had to be, you had to be patient. It does, this didn't happen. You know, we started in 2006, and the first year we did uh, exactly zero dollars in revenue. And I, that's an easy number to remember. Uh, uh, <laughs> But, you know, you, you have to stay with it and grow it and, and you know, have the risk tolerance to, to make it work. Well, it's a great story. You might be interested in talking to Jared Arnett uh, back there in the back. He's the executive director of, of SOAR, shaping our Appalachian region. Sure. They're looking for a few good companies. So you might uh, want to touch base with Jared. Uh, a great to big hand for Hugh Hayden. Thanks, Bill. <laughs> 